good evening ladies and gentlemen my name is joy and i am an architect and an interactive artist let me begin by sort of laying down what we architects do when we're not working what sort of people we are this is an image uh, of my friends who went to belgium recently they didn't go to a wine shop they didn't get, uh, go to get chocolate they didn't go to eat cheese they directly went to the latest building that was built in Belgium by an architect called Zaha Hadid. And this was the first picture posted on Facebook from their entire trip. Which essentially means that we architects, even in our downtime, find a way to surround ourselves with architecture. So in a way, we are architecting even when we are not actively architecting. So what happens is that we are surrounded by a group of other kinds of designers as well. So we have architects, artists, musicians, uh, product designers, fashion designers, so on and so forth. And so effectively what happens is that we sort of stay in a cocoon. We stay secluded. For example, uh, can I have a show of hands how many architects are here? There is an architecture department in this college, by the way. Probably none. Yes, thought so. so in a, in a bunch of around 300 people, there is no architect. Probably he or she or all of them are busy architecting somewhere. Now, so the problem with such a situation is that we are secluded, so to speak, socially, and uh, we have honestly lost touch with the larger mass. So back in 2014, when I woke up one fine day and opened my news feed, this is what I saw. Now, you, all of you know the guy, uh, in, f in the foreground of the picture, the one in the background is the architect. They are discussing the Facebook headquarters. The architect is Frank Gehry, and this is what he said. I'm not sure I can read it out. But 98% buildings are horrible in nature, architecturally speaking. And this guy, uh, is won Pritzker, which is the equivalent of Oscar in architecture. So we can take his word for what it's worth. This made me wonder, because like I said, I am surrounded with people who are creative at the same time. I see finely crafted uh, leather shoes, uh, the tactile nature of Kashmir, uh, scarves, beautifully designed facades. That is what we all discuss about all day long. And so this guy is saying that 98% of buildings are bad. That, that comes as a surprise to me. So what I did was I started collecting pictures uh, from places around India. So what I noticed was that he was indeed actually right. So for example, this flyover infrastructure, this is crossing over a balcony. Now it's bad enough that I cannot enjoy the view with my morning cup of coffee. Now they have also obstructed the balcony, just that they won't let a man enjoy his cup of coffee. It just doesn't make sense. Moving on, uh, public planning. There is no access to view to sky. If you notice, the entire 180 degrees is, is covered by buildings. There is not a single parcel from where or to where you can see sky. Uh, this is uh, supposedly an upmarket uh, residential colony in Delhi. If you notice the facades of the buildings, they are incoherent in nature and also very haphazard and chaotic. <clears throat> And finally, the informal sector. Well, we know the hazards of informal sector. There is no fire safety. There is no thumb rule followed anywhere or any bylaw followed anywhere, which leads to other very practical issues. So uh, if I have to ask myself, why is this the case? Why is 98% of what we build so bad in quality? Now, let's assume a guy has saved 20 to 30 lakhs by walking throughout his life and he wants to build his house. What are his options? If he goes to someone like Frank Gehry, a renowned architect, he would probably charge two lakh rupees. Now two lakh rupees just for the design of your house out of 20 to 30 lakh rupees doesn't make any financial sense. I wouldn't go to Frank Gehry if I had 20 to 30 lakh rupees. Next option, find an experienced architect from India. He or she might charge 75,000 bucks. Still doesn't make any sense to me. Next option, any young architect, upcoming architect from the region, probably charged 25,000, probably I could hire him or her. What are my other options? A fresh architect who's just graduated or about to graduate will charge around 15,000 rupees. 
And the last option, which is the most availed one, is the local mason or Raju Mistri, as we know him. His uh, package of service includes design for free. Why is that? How is it free? Now, if I have to use the same language of Frank Gehry, and the lower curve represents the amount of horrible quality of your design, because Raju Mistri doesn't really design, it comes for free. It's as simple as that. Raju Mistri's quality would be the least, whereas the renowned architect's quality will be the best, which is, again, shown in the magenta curve. So the question is, if, let's say, I can afford a young architect for 25,000 rupees, why am I not going to him or her? Why am I going to Raju Mistri? What is the problem? Why is, again, 98% buildings bad? Now, then I plotted our uh, income versus percentile population of India. Now, an average young graduate uh, who studied architecture earns uh, 25,000 per month, which is around 3 lakh a year, plotted on the graph. What I notice is that he or she already belongs to the top 2% of the entire population. Now, we all know money doesn't go from the lower portion to the upper portion, which essentially means just as you pass, just as you finish your course, right at that moment, you started working for only top 2% of the Indian population. God forbid you end up being Frank Harry. Probably this percentage will reduce to 0.005%, given the amount of fee you will demand. Which essentially means 98% Indians cannot afford architects. It's a staggering amount. 98% people cannot afford architects. How is that possible? I don't know how Frank Gehry got right with the percentage. Maybe he ran his numbers, or maybe it is a coincidence. But if I run the numbers in India, 98% people cannot afford architects. Now, to put this figure into perspective, by 2022, 8.2 crore housing units or residences have to be built. If I interpolate the same percentage, out of 8.2, 8 crores won't be designed by architects. 8 crore informally, organically, or designed by Raju Mistri will be houses built. Again, staggering number. Which leaves, so there are around 50,000 architects registered in India, which essentially means each architect would be in charge of 8 residences per year. Now, any architectural graduate or practice, or anyone who practices architecture would tell you that just by himself or herself, eight residences is a daunting task. Now, the question is, why is it difficult? Why is an architecture accessible to all? It's, it's because accessibility is inversely proportional to the fee charged, or the cost, or the charge. So now, for example, more people travel in cabs because Ola, and Uber have made it more accessible. Probably more people will switch to using smartphones because GeoReliance has made it more accessible. Rather, they have made it free. Now, fee, in turn, is uh, proportionate to the manner spent in the project and the profit that is earned from the project. But the little portion called profit is, in a way, again, throwback is proportionate to the mana spent, which is to say, if I'm spending one day on a project, probably I would want 5,000 bucks for it. If I'm spending a whole week, I would want seven into 5,000 bucks for it. Which essentially ends up being, your, the fee charged is essentially proportionate to the manas involved of a project. Which means, again, accessibility is inversely proportional to manas. Now, when I propose this to my colleagues, all my colleagues, turn nihilists. They say that the question you're asking is unanswerable. The pursuit of reducing manners, given the way we work, is meaningless. But I tell them, you know what? Enough of Satre and Kamu. Let's, let's figure out a solution for it. And the solution is already there. We just need to look outside, borrow things from other industries, and connect them in the right workflow. Now, essentially, what an architect does is, at at different systemic levels, the room size and orientation may vary. And along with that, different rooms are interconnected. 
you find the right interconnectivity and the right set of sizes, you get an essential layout, and then you convert that layout into a stylistic embodiment, be it an example of modern architecture, late modern architecture, vernacular architecture, whatever it is. Now, this change from the layout to a nice stylistic 3D is taken care by something called Shape Grammar, an algorithm called Shape Grammar, which is being used by the gaming industry for a decade now. This particular game, SimCity, uh, developers don't sit around and model all these buildings. These are generated through very basic level rules, similar to the game of Conway, where you set local level rules and they, the entire form emerges from those. You set simple rules and the form emerges from that. So now I'm going to talk about this little research me and a couple of my friends, Gaurav and Pratik, have undertaken. It's, and I'll take you through the steps and I'll, I'll tell you the positives and the way and one way in which we can address the problem of reaching out to more people and giving service to more people. So you can define your room in a very soft, manner, not discrete, using minimum, maximum, and an optimum area, length, width, and also the aspect ratio of the room. So once you have a fuzzy boundary, you can stochastically select the right size of the room depending on the interconnection of the rooms and the size of the plot available. Now let's say the user comes, these are the, this is a sample case, uh, rooms 1 to 12, the user comes and draws these interconnections. The wide gray fat line is, uh, let's say, the staircase. The user says that room number one will be connected to north, so on and so forth, and these rooms are to be connected, and those rooms are not to be connected. So the first step would be, I'm briefly going through the algorithm, so to speak, the steps of it. First step would be to take out the crisscrosses, the knots, simplify the graph, Next step would be to connect all the outer rooms to the cardinal directions to sort of ascertain which rooms should face north, which rooms face, should face south, so on and so forth. And the last step is, uh, as far as the graph is concerned, is triangulating the graph, which anyone who's studied graph theory is the necessary thing to do to planarize a graph to then turn it into its rectangular dual. Rectangular dual, in our case, is the layout. So after that, we divide the graph into x and y directions, which relates to the x dimension of that particular room and the y directions dimension of that particular room. Now, this po little portion was graph theory. On top of that, if you add PERT, which is again a very basic and straightforward algorithm used by project managers, uh, it can be used to ascertain the length of the rooms so that the exact outer boundary of your building won't be exact. It would be a perfect rectangle or a perfect square, however you wish. This is an example of that. So if you notice the, uh, the magenta lines to be uh, f uh, notifying the x-axis dimension and the cyan ones notifying the y-axis dimensions, the moment you overlap them, you have the layout. And if you correlate the two graphs, the lower graph is the original connections made by the user and the upper graph is the plan. So you can notice the adjacencies remain the same. But all of it is calculated based on the room sizes already assigned from a set preset. Now, I've taken some examples. I've added uh, a courtyard and a few more rooms to sort of make the example more complex. These six examples of, of layouts come from the same design problem. Different orientation uh, of, of courtyard, different ways of configuring, configuring my rooms. I'm going to explain uh, the right topmost one, uh, how to convert that into a stylistic embodiment. So for example, we take that layout and we turn it into featureism. Featureism is where you have intricate jolly work. Now this is taken care of by shape grammar. Computationally speaking, this is pretty straightforward. The, the argument is figure out the surface on the first floor and then populate that with circular perforations. Modernism continuous, wherein you have a continuous uh, glazing to connect visually the interior to the exterior. Uh, country styled uh, development of the same layout. Modernism split. And lastly, an example of what Frank Gehry says, uh, the horrible style of architecture. Shape grammar wise, be lazy, pick out every surface, populate random windows on it. That's about it. No need to do anything. Now. 
the reason why I went through the steps is because these steps are fractal in nature. So at every step, you have, let's say, 100 different possibilities. And the moment you go to a different possibilities, by trickle-down effect, your eventual outcome will be different. So for these five steps, for any design problem, within 15 minutes, you'll be given at least one lakh different options of different layouts, of different stylistic embodiments. And the advantage of this is, is because it is computed, now you can compare your options. Which one works best in terms of reducing cost? Which one works best in terms of consuming the least amount of energy? And so or the counter argument would be, another way of putting it would be, for, let's say, more on, an example of modern architecture, which are the five options which have the least amount of energy consumption? Or even across all stylistic borders, which are the top five options which have, let's say, the least amount of uh, cost involved? So, so to, to summarize, uh, what I would like to say is that we as designers, architects, we are not agents of construction. Construction is taken care by uh, at this moment, market forces by our developers who are making, uh, who are constructing housings. Historically, it has been taken care by socialist uh, schemes by governments, uh, and at the same time, through philanthropical work by corporations or individual people. What we architects can do is get inspired by what Mr. Ford did in the mid 19th century, that is, democratize the production of uh, vehicles. And what Wikihouse has been doing lately, that is, they have democratized the construction process of houses. So now you can up upload your design and get the 3D printed parts, and you can construct it. Now is the time to reach out to the rest 98%. To reach out to the rest 98%, we need to turn our design process open source. Because not only is it a socialistic disaster, it also doesn't make any business sense doesn't make any business sense. So if I spend only 15 minutes to get out, to get one lakh different options for a design, only 15 minutes compared to what usually takes a week, at least to a month, depending on the complexity of the design. The amount of fee that I'll end up charging will be far less. So the catchment area of my clients, or in, in other words, the people I can give design to will increase automatically. So. At the end, I, I got to borrow a, a line from Jack uh, Kerak and say that uh, all designers all across the board need to sort of burn like fabulous yellow Roman candles. And we need to reach out, do more, because 8.2 crore units are to be built. A nation is to be built. We need to increase the percentage of people we reach out to. Otherwise, 98% is not a flattering figure as far as the horrible nature of architecture is concerned. Thank you.